Hi, welcome to American Literature. Um, so today I will introduce the course and introduce the course. Yes, okay, so let's introduce the course. Um, this course will be reading key works from American literature. Um, as you can see, we're going to, every week we're going to read um, one story or five short poems. Right. Um, and each week, please finish the assigned reading before coming to class. In class, I will present some discussion questions and I will ask you to discuss uh, with friends. I will go around, talk with you, get your ideas. And then I will share your ideas with the rest of the class. The discussion questions are all open ended questions, so I'm not going to ask you uh, what happens on page 33 or what is the name of this person's cat? I'm going to ask you things like, why do you think this person says this? Or do you think this part of the story makes sense? Or what do you think is the symbolism of this part? So these questions do not have one right answer. In fact, I would be very happy if you could give me more than one answer for your discussion question. There will be a midterm exam and a final exam. Um, and the grades are the exams are each 40% and then 20% is attendance. Attendance just means that you either come to class or you take leave. If you don't come to class and you don't take leave, each week I will take away three points out of 20, which is 15%. Um, so if you can't make it, please remember to take leave. Uh, and week 18, we're going to watch a movie. Yay. So here's what's on the Moodle page. The front door is broken. I can't close it. Um, could somebody please help me lock the front door? Thank you. Okay, so Moodle, my email, if you need to contact me. Um, please don't send an email just to chat. Class emails. I'll try to give you the important information every week, but if something comes up and I can't wait for class, I will send you an email using Moodle and there will be a record here. Lecture recordings. I am recording this lecture. I will be recording every lecture and I will upload every recording to YouTube. Um, you already have subtitles here, but I'm recording. I'm, I'm uploading it to YouTube because YouTube has another function. It can generate searchable transcripts. Uh, and I have a video here teaching you how to use that. Basically, it, you, when, when you open the transcript uh, and you click on any one line, the video will jump to that line. So if you need to search for something in the video, you don't have to watch through the whole video. Field trip reflections. Yes, we are going to be taking a field trip um, week 10, I think. Week 11, November 22, field trip. and. You're all going to go to the graduation thesis conference. This year, the conference will be here in Taoren campus. So it's technically not a field trip. You're not going out into the field. You're just going to a different classroom. Um, I have to go because I am advising five groups. So I probably won't have time to come here and uh, do this class with you. 
And so if I have to go, you have to go. And to make sure that you do go, I will ask you to write some reflections, Xingde. Um, you can write whatever you want. Just try to convince me that you actually went to that conference. Uh, and I will use those reflections for that week's attendance. Notice the deadline. I only give you until. OK, so November 22 is Friday. So November 25 is Monday. I only give you until Monday midnight. So please don't uh, forget to do this. I will remind you um, the previous week. Next, we have some information that could be helpful to you. Um, I take all of our readings from a textbook. I don't ask you to buy the textbook because the textbook is like 4,000 pages and we're not going to read 4,000 pages. So I don't want you to pay for 4,000 pages. Um, but the textbook does give us an introduction to each author. I did not print them for you because it would be too long. But if you're interested, here are all of the introductions. Uh, next, we have a document that is a brief introduction to American literary history. Um, our textbook also has a very, very long introduction to each period of American literary history. Um, I read through them all and I made some notes of like key moments and key ideas and I organized them into this PDF. Now, in the past, I taught this course as a literary history course. The problem though is that American literary history is only like 350 years old. And the textbook divides these 350 years into six periods. Now, usually in a literary history course for the exam, I would give you something to read and ask you to tell me uh, which literary period does this belong to and why. But if each literary period is only like 50 years, Society doesn't change that much in 50 years, so it can be really hard to try to explain why this text belongs in this period and not the one before or the one after. So this semester I'm teaching this course as just a literature course. We're going to be looking at works of literature, talking about works of literature, and the history will be there just to help you understand. I'm not going to focus too much on the history. Um, but knowing some of the history does help you understand. So I have given you the file that I used uh, before when I was teaching this as literary history. Uh, and hopefully um, if you get stuck or you, so there's something you don't understand, uh, you can go through this file, look up some key terms, learn a bit about American history, and that might help you understand. Now, the exams are still going to be one week take home online open ended essay questions. So for essay questions, please don't copy answers that you find on the Internet. Please don't copy answers from your friend. Uh, and. Um, GPT, right. I mean, if you want to use ChatGPT, you can, but it's not very accurate. So you may get a low score. You may not even pass if you only use ChatGPT. You can use it to help you, but you still have to take responsibility for your answer. Now, uh, this is a PDF article in Chinese about some of the benefits of reading literature. Um, so if for some reason you're here, but you don't know why you're here, you can take a look at this PDF to help get you motivated about reading. Um, you guys have all taken introduction to British literature, right? 
So you you pretty much know what kind of course this is and what kind of things you will be reading. Um, do you think that you benefited from taking British literature? Did it help you in some way? OK, so maybe uh, American literature can help you in some different ways. Uh, this will be where I input your attendance grade. You can't see this. I have hidden it from you. Um, and then starting here, I have a PDF copy of the handout. So if you forget to bring your copy uh, in an emergency, you can use the online version. The discussion questions for each week have already been prepared and uploaded. So if as you are reading, you maybe get confused, you're not sure what the point of reading this is, you can use my discussion questions as a guide. Like these are the questions that I think are important for this text or some of the interesting parts of this text. Uh, and so as you read, you can focus on these points. There will be two handouts, one for the midterm exam, one for the final exam. Uh, and then week 17, we're going to talk about Taylor Swift. The exams. I'll talk about this in more detail uh, in week eight. But the basic idea is when you answer these essay questions, there are certain format rules you have to follow. It has to be in English, has to be an essay, it has to have more than one paragraph, and the paragraphs cannot be itemized, which means don't give me a list of points. Don't give me a list of things. Give me an, a complete essay. Um, let's see what else. Open book. You can use any resource except other people. So you can use the handout. You can use your class notes. You can use the internet. You can use AI. But you cannot talk to another human except for me. You can talk to me. Um, because I can decide how much information to give you. Now, here is how I grade your exams. You must give at least four pieces of specific evidence from your chosen class readings. OK, so if I'm not asking you about literary periods, what will the exam ask you about? For each exam, I will give you something to read. You can't see this. Um, but there's a midterm exam text and a final exam text. These are short, uh, between one to three pages. I will ask you to read it, and then uh, I will ask you to choose at least one thing that we have read in class so far, and I want you to compare these two. How well does the text that you chose fit the text that I chose. Do they match? Does my choice describe your choice? How yes, how no? Where do they match? Where do they not match? And why? Uh, and so to discuss your answer, you have to choose at least one thing that we have read in class. And when you talk about your choice, you must give at least four pieces of specific evidence. When I say specific evidence, I mean for a poem, give me the line number, Digi Hang. And for a story, please give the page number. So at least four pieces of evidence from your choice or choices. I'll talk about this in more detail in week eight. 
Uh, so again, don't cheat, don't copy. If you want to understand why you shouldn't copy, here is an article in Chinese. If you have not had experience answering essay questions, here are some example answers to other essay questions. So you can see what a, a good answer looks like. Um, and the first file is a bad answer, so you know what to avoid. Uh, exams, right? You will have one week. Oh, this one week will include uh, class time. November 1, we have class. November 8, we also have class. So the class of November 8 is still before the deadline you can talk to me about your answer if you want to. Same thing for the final exam. Finally, we have this extra credit. If you don't think you're going to pass, you can do the last chance quiz. What is the last chance quiz? You'll find out if you take it. Um, if you do a good job, I may let you pass anyway. Now, I encourage you don't depend on this. You should still try your best to pass the course. So you can only start taking this quiz. I think this is week 18. After class on week 18. Now, if you think you will pass the course, but you want a higher grade, you can do the extra credit assignment. Basically, read this file and think about your college life and then write 1000 English words. Basically, that's it. But if you want to do this, uh, I encourage you to read the details of the assignment more carefully. This is not easy to read. I did not choose something easy for you. Um, so if you really want a higher grade, you will have to do a little bit of work. Now, because this extra credit assignment includes a word count, I also want to warn you about the Google Docs error. What's wrong with this picture? The there are two words selected, but the computer says it's five words. This is because the computer is counting each letter as a word. So if you do the extra credit and you come across this problem um, and the computer says you have 1000 words, actually you only have 1000 letters. So if you do the extra credit, please be careful. How can you tell if you have this problem? Look at line two and line three. These both begin with parts of words. These are not complete words. Um, and this is again because the computer thinks that each letter is its own word. So it doesn't care about where it breaks a word in half. So if you see some lines that begin in the middle of words for no reason, you might have run into this problem. Um, usually this happens when you write something using Google Docs and then you save it as a Microsoft Word file or as a PDF. Uh, and then this happens. The solution, I only know one way to solve this problem. Copy everything. Open up something that is not Microsoft, so like a, a blogging website or like Notepad, G Siban. Paste everything in, copy everything again, open a new Microsoft Word file, and then paste it in. Um, but the best way is just to you know try to avoid this problem in the first place. Okay, that's the Moodle. Questions? Okay, so let me give you the handout and then we will talk a bit more in detail um, about the first text 
And if we have extra time, I guess I will talk to you about the history. So before next week, please finish reading Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is a short story that goes up to page. Uh, 11, 10, page 10. OK, let's talk a bit about Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hawthorne wrote in the 19th century, early 19th century, but he loved to write a historical fiction. So he wrote about uh, North American society before the beginning of the United States. So at that time, uh, North America was a collection of British colonies, Ming Di, uh, and the England of the time was deeply religious following the English church, the Anglican church. So a lot of the stories are of that time are related to religion. Um, if we read, we're not going to, but if we read actual literature from that period, most of it is related to religion. But Hawthorne is writing historical fiction. He's writing about that society from a later time period. And in the early 19th century, even though religion was still very important, there were other developments. The improvement of technology, the growing debate about slavery and women's rights. So when Hawthorne is writing about the past, he's also including these ideas in his writing. For example, even though he's a man, uh, his writing has very uh, important and even strong and um, complete female characters. Um, not this story, though, sorry. Um, but it shows that he's using the mindset of a later period to talk about an earlier period. But this also means that um, in order to present the earlier period, he might use language that is closer to that earlier period. So some of the words he uses will be a bit older. For example, in the title, Goodman, Goodman just means man. Uh, so Goodman Brown today, we would call him Mr. Brown. Um, Hawthorne lived in the Northeast uh, in Massachusetts. He was born to uh, an important family. And so he was also, uh, he also was very interested in the Salem witchcraft trials. 
this happened in the late 17th century where women were accused of being witches and put on trial. Now, the law worked differently back then. Instead of looking at the science, they looked at the religious proof. So, for example, uh, they thought if a woman is tied up and tossed into the water and she floats, then she's a witch. I'm sure you can see the problem with this, right? Because if you get tied up and you get tossed into the water and you sink, you die. But if you float, you're a witch. Another common test was uh, if you tie the woman up and you burn them and they die, they're not a witch. Same problem, right? Either you live and you're a witch or you die and you're not a witch. So um, today we think of the Salem witchcraft trials as just a very terrible, terrible expression of a misogynist patriarchal culture and religion. Um, but at the time, uh, it, even in Hawthorne's time, there were still people who believed in witches. They didn't necessarily believe that the witchcraft trials were a good thing, but they did believe that there were witches. Uh, to the people of that time period, especially before the Industrial Revolution, religion was not just something private or something you do every Sunday. Religion was a part of everyday life. So, for example, um, these British people, they come to North America, which has not been widely developed. It has been cultivated and developed. There were people living in North America, right? The Native Americans. But the Native American culture often preserved a lot of nature. So to these British people, they come here and they basically see trees and forests. Um, and if they come from places like London or like big cities, this can be very strange. And because they are so far from home, it can also be scary. And this is the instinct behind describing the forest as like dark and scary and creepy. At that time, when most of the North American land was still unexplored by Europeans. It was a literal unknown country. Like uh, if you play a video game, right? Like once you go past the borders of your town, you don't know what's out there. But this, is, this wasn't a game. This was what it was really like. You could literally walk west until you die and not find anyone. So, um, when you believe in a religion that talks about gods and a god, one god, angels and demons and ghosts and witches, and then you live on the edge of known civilization, things can get very scary. Like if you go hunting in the woods and you get lost, um, there's a very high chance you might die if you don't know how to find your way back. Uh, so this is the kind of society, this is the kind of atmosphere that uh, Hawthorne is writing about. Again, he's writing historical fiction. In his own day, uh, Western civilization had moved even further west to the Mississippi River and even past the Mississippi River. And some people have even crossed the continent to California to start a new life there. Um, but in the pre-US period where Hawthorne's stories are set, that has not happened yet. Um, and you want, if you want to see what that feels like, you can go track down a movie called The Witch, uh, which is set in this time period, and it is a horror movie. It is quite scary. Um, so that's the introduction to the story. Young Goodman Brown is about this young man named Brown who has a meeting in the forest, which is already very strange. Why would you have a meeting in the middle of the forest? 
But as he goes to his meeting, he is joined by a stranger. Uh, and this stranger. Let's just say he does not seem like a nice guy. Um, and as Goodman Brown is going to this meeting, he leaves his wife behind at home and his wife's name is Faith. And I think that gives you enough of an idea of what this story could be about. OK, do you have questions about Hawthorne and the reading? All right, if not, we have some time left, and by some, I mean 80 minutes. Uh, so let's talk a bit about literary history. Um, so the early period, all from like the beginning all the way to around 1820. Um, the This period includes what the textbook calls the colonial period and the revolutionary period. Uh, the division between the two is when the United States begins. Um, so some key events that have an impact on American literature. Gutenberg invents the printing press in Europe. Pope Nicholas V authorizes pagan slavery. So when Western European people first landed in the new world, right? North America, South America. They discovered there were people already living there. But these people had a different culture, different language, different beliefs. So it was a question whether these were actually humans or whether they only looked like humans. Um, and because this was Western Europe in the 15th century, this became a religious question. So finally, the Pope made a decision. He said, OK, yes, these are humans. But because they have never heard of Jesus Christ, you can turn them into slaves and that's OK. Um, but if they become Christians, then they cannot be slaves. You have to set them free. Uh, and this is foreshadowing because we know that the US had a big problem with slavery later. 1492, Columbus sets sail and arrives in the West Indies. He arrives in what today is the Caribbean, Jada Bihai. Basically, he gets to what today is uh, the Dominican Republic, the eastern half of Haiti. And he thinks that he has arrived in a whole new world. Or no, he, he thinks he has arrived in India. He set sail because he he has heard that some people believe the world is not flat, the world is round. And so he's thinking, if the world is round, then maybe I can get to India faster by going in the other direction. So he sails across the Atlantic, he hits land, and he thinks he has arrived in India. Only, of course, very soon after people realize that's not India, but the name has already been uh, given. So. Today, even today, we call that place the West Indies. This is also the source of the name American Indians. Uh, so Western uh, Europe at that time was all about competing empires, different European countries sailing all around the world, claiming new places for their kings and queens. Uh, and what did they do in these empires? There was a lot of proselytizing, which means spreading religion. So you have like missionaries, or even ordinary people uh, trying to turn people into Christians. You had lots of trading. There are so many things that Europe did not have. For example, horses, potatoes, corn. Um, and uh, like a lot of other things as well that all came from North and South America. Uh, so there was a lot of trading. The Europeans also brought alcohol with them. Of course, Native Americans had alcohol, but they drank a very light kind of alcohol. Europeans drank whiskey. 
and vodka and things like that. And so like the added, um, um, not intensity, but like the, the, the added alcohol content really um, had a negative effect on people who had never drunk this kind of alcohol before. Made uh, people more easily drunk, made them more addicted, that kind of thing. Uh, Europeans also brought diseases, right? These two continents were divided by an ocean for thousands of years. The diseases evolved in different ways. So when Europeans came, they also brought new diseases like smallpox. Um, Douhua, no, was it Douhua? Um, I can't remember the Chinese. Tianhua, yes, Tianhua. Uh, thankfully, today smallpox is no longer existing in the wild, but like for Native Americans who had no defense, this was essentially a genocide. Some sources say up to 90% of Native Americans died from diseases brought by Europeans. And you know, the Europeans at first, they didn't know what was going on, but then somebody figured it out. And they realized that they were bringing diseases to the Native Americans. And so later, when the Europeans fought wars against the Native Americans, one tactic was biological warfare. They would pretend to be nice and give blankets to the Native Americans that were infected with smallpox as a weapon. Uh, and then, of course, there was colonization, right? So they didn't just send people to turn people into Christians and make money. They also sent people to live there. And one reason to create colonies is, of course, to better control the economy. But another reason is because um, in Western Europe at that time, urbanization was going very strong. Cities were growing by hundreds and thousands of people every year. And so there was a huge population pressure. And one way the governments decided to solve this problem is to send some people across the sea and to make them live in the colonies. What kind of people? Criminals. People who believed in different religions. People who were poor and had no family. Basically, any excuse they could find to send somebody away, they took the excuse and they sent them. So in some ways, when the colonies later rebelled against their home countries, it wasn't that surprising, right? It's like, you kicked me out, so why should I still follow you? In 1501, the first enslaved Africans were impor imported to Hispaniola. Hispaniola is, again, the island today that is on the east, the Dominican Republic, on the west, Haiti, Haiti. So this is the first time that enslaved Africans were brought to North America. In 1565, a Spanish colony was founded in what is today Florida. So the first European country to set up a colony in North America was Spain, or not North America, in what is today the United States, was Spain. Uh, and so that's why, like, if you go to Florida today, there is a large population of Spanish speakers because Florida also has Spanish cultural history. In 1588, Thomas Harriet published, uh, uh, wrote and published a brief and true report of the new found land of Virginia. This was one of the earliest historical accounts of a British North American colony. Uh, and it was very influential in England. Before this, people could only read like short pieces or letters in the newspaper. But here was a whole book that went into detail about what it was like to live in a British North American colony. Or in British North America. In 1607, the Jamestown colony was founded by the British. Uh, in Virginia. 
I think, Jamestown, Virginia. This was the first major colony by the British. It, be, it established a, a permanent British presence in North America. In 1614, New Netherland was founded by the Dutch, and this colony later turned into New York City. So yes, New York City was not an English colony. It was a Dutch colony. Um, do you know how they got the land? Like some colonies, uh, you know, they, they fought off the Indians, right? But New Netherland, they got their land by trading for it. They went to the local Native Americans and they said, we want your land. What do you want? And the Native Americans said, we want your jewelry. Because um, North American society at that time did not have a large mining industry. Uh, all of the rare minerals and jewelry they found they had were basically found, not dug up. And so when they saw these Europeans uh, where, like with colorful beads and, and jewelry, they thought this was one of the most beautiful things they'd ever seen. But this was this is considered an unfair trade because for the Europeans, land was much more valuable than colorful beads and jewelry. So today we think of this as Europeans cheating the Native Americans out of their land. Also because at that time, Native Americans did not have the concept of land ownership. They had the concept of land conservatorship. In, in other words, nobody owns the land, but some people are responsible for taking care of the land. And so uh, they didn't have the idea that if you own the land, you can do whatever you want on top of that land. Uh, and so when they did the deal with the Dutch, they didn't really know what they were agreeing to. They thought, oh, OK, we'll let you take care of the land. And then when you leave, we'll get somebody else to take care of the land. But the Dutch were saying, no, this is ours. Go away. We will now do whatever we want. So yes, New York City was founded on cheating the Native Americans. In 1620, Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts was founded by pilgrims. Pilgrims were a kind of Christian that were too extreme for the government. And so the government kicked them out and sent them to North America. In American history, pilgrims are good guys because they helped start the new country. But in English history, pilgrims are bad guys because they kept causing trouble and trying to fight against the government. Um, and the reason they disagreed with the government is that pilgrims had a more extreme belief. They believed not only that you have to go to church and that you have to believe in Jesus Christ, they also believed that you had to have a pure lifestyle. You had to follow strict religious rules in your daily life. It's kind of like how some of the more extreme believers in Islam today also believe you have to follow many different rules in everyday life. Otherwise, we're going to kill you. Uh, so again, not every Muslim believes that, right? But some extreme believers do, just like the pilgrims were also extreme believers of Christianity. Um, and so like, if again, if you go watch the movie, The Witch, that is taking place in a pilgrim society where they, they really took religion very seriously every day. Uh, and so because England kept sending like uh, different kinds of Christians to North America, like as long as you don't believe in the Anglican church, the official church, you might be sent here. And so there were many different kinds of Christian in North America. Protestants, mostly, Xinjiao, uh, but also some Catholics, uh, also some other strange kinds. And so they also fought among themselves. Religion at the time was a big motivator for war um, because they all believed it very strongly. So uh, not only did Europeans fight against Indians, they also fought, uh, different countries, colonies fought against each other. So like the British fought against the French, fought against the Spanish. And then different 
religions also fought against each other. So like the colonies were really a really wild place to be. 1692, the Salem witchcraft trials, we talked about that. Um, the trials bring up some questions about larger movements in history, like the Enlightenment, Dong, the new importance on human reason. The reason the witchcraft trials ended is not because they caught all the witches, and it's not because people stopped believing in witches. The witchcraft trials ended because people started having new ideas about proof. What counts as proof that someone is a witch? Uh, and these new ideas are mostly thanks to the Enlightenment. Um, and if humans all have reason, if we can all think rationally, then even humans of different religions or different races or even American Indians deserve uh, to be treated like human beings is something that people started to believe more and more. At the time, this was called sympathy, but really what they mean is empathy, Tong Throughout the history of the English language, the words sympathy and empathy switched meanings a couple of times. Um, here it means empathy. There is also a new interest in natural history. Um, after people started um, thinking about the world as developing thanks to natural and scientific processes, and then people started to be interested, how did the world develop? Can we figure out a history of the natural world by looking at the evidence? Um, this was before Darwin, right? Darwin, he was in the mid 19th century. So they didn't yet know about evolution, but they did know that things changed over time. And so there was this new interest in like collecting animals, collecting insects, plants, things like that. And there was a similar interest in different cultures. Ethnography is the study of different human cultures. Uh, and so, uh, for example, when somebody went to a different culture or a different place, they might write their recollections or write like their experiences and try to make sense of this culture. Uh, and so this is also uh, connected to memoirs, lu, and also connected to travel literature. In the years 1726 to 1756, North America experienced something called the Great Awakening. And this is when people uh, who were not so serious about religion suddenly caught the bug and became really, really faithful and really passionate. And so here you have things like uh, preachers talking in tongues, which means like there is babbling nonsense saying that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak in a holy language that people cannot understand. You had preachers going around performing miracles, curing sick people, curing blind people. Uh, you had uh, preachers saying that, uh, you know, if you say these words and say you believe in Jesus Christ once again and you like jump into the river, you will enter heaven. A lot of really passionate religious people in this period. And it's called a revivalism because, as I said, some of the people who came to North America were already very religious, but slowly they may have uh, lost some of their intensity because they're so focused on building a new society. But in this period, the religious intensity came back. And one good example is the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Edwards was a preacher or a priest. And this uh, every week in church, he would read a sermon to his followers or congregation as a kind of moral or religious lesson. This one was so famous, it got published and became important for literary history. Basically, the entire sermon is saying, 
if you make one small mistake, just one, you're going to hell. And the entire sermon is listing all different kinds of mistakes that you could make. As you can see, the audience was terrified. And what makes this really fun is Edwards didn't perform. He only read it very simply, very straightforward, very calm reading. And still it was so scary that they say some members of the audience fainted. Okay, let's take a short break.
From 1775 to 1783 was the American Revolutionary War. Yes, the war began before the US declared independence in 1776. Um, and one reason, well, I mean, there are many reasons for the revolution, but the main reason is because King George the, I want to say fifth, I can't remember which King George, but the King George of England at the time needed money, and he decided to get that money from his North American colony. He kept raising taxes on North America, adding different kinds of taxes, and the colonists could not say no because they did not have a member of Congress. Sorry, they did not have a member of Parliament who could speak on their behalf. Uh, and so the main rallying cry for the uh, colonial rebels was no taxation without representation. If you don't give me a member of parliament, I'm not going to pay your taxes. The king, of course, could not accept this, so he sent the Royal British Army to make sure that the colonists paid their taxes. Uh, and thus began the American Revolutionary War. This was a really, really important event. First of all, because it started the United States, which is the first modern Amer uh, first modern democratic republic, but also because it marked the first time that a colony successfully rebelled against its home country. Uh, and it also marked a serious defeat for the British army. The British army at that time was considered one of the most powerful in the world. The American rebels had no money, no food, no clothing, basically nothing, and the Americans won. So this was a huge world historical event. Of course, the Americans didn't win by themselves, right? They won with the help of some Indian tribes, not all of them. They won with the help of some French and Spanish support because the French and Spanish were also fighting against England in terms of like empire and competing for colonies and resources. So they were thinking if the British lose, that's good for me. Um, but yeah, anyway, the Americans won and they started a new country. Uh, so the American colonists, the leaders were pretty much agreed they wanted to fight the British, but not all of the regular people agreed. In 1776, Thomas Paine published a pamphlet or like a short essay or a long essay or a short book called Common Sense, where he's arguing that we should fight the British. It was a very popular work. Uh, and it changed a lot of minds. It, it, it successfully persuaded a lot of people to join the fight. In 1782, J. Hector St. John de Crevecoeur published Letters from an American Farmer. He was French. Uh, after the uh, British lost the war, there was a new country in North America. But not everybody living in that country was English. You already had Spanish colonies and French colonies in North America. So you already had people trading, people traveling, doing business, um, starting families. And so when suddenly the British colonies became a new country, everybody living there suddenly became Americans, including this guy who started out as a French colonist and suddenly became American. Um, and this was one of the first and most important works of memoir and I guess you could call it travel literature. It's written for Europe, right? It's written to show Europeans what it was like to live in this new country. 
in now after the Americans won the war, then they had to decide what kind of country they wanted, what kind of constitution did they want. At the time, there were two main main choices. The first choice is called the Articles of Confederation, and it's a, a style of government that is very weak. Each state had a lot of power. And when the states came together and made decisions for everybody, every state had to agree. Now, as you can imagine, it's hard to get 13 states to agree on many things together. Uh, so the alternative is a federal constitution, which is what the US has today. In other words, things that are related to everybody get decided by a federal government. But if it's not related to everybody, then each state can decide for itself. This kind of country system gave the central government more power. Uh, now, of, at the beginning, most state leaders wanted the first option, a weaker central government, which makes sense, right? They wanted to keep a, as much power for themselves as possible. But mostly through the efforts of Hamilton, Jay, and Madison, uh, these three people wrote a series of newspaper articles explaining why a powerful central government is better for the country, why people should choose a federal constitution instead of an article of confederation. Uh, and they wrote, I think it was 103 essays. Uh, explaining each part of the Constitution design. Uh, even today, these papers are cited by the U.S. Supreme Court as evidence of what the Founding Fathers wanted the country to be and to do in terms of the design of the government. Um, and like ten year, five or ten years ago, there was also a Broadway musical made about Alexander Hamilton. Uh, it was pretty good. Um, it, James Madison appears in the musical, but not John Jay, because John Jay, he only wrote three letters and then he died because he got sick. So not that important. 1790 is the first copyright act. Yes, before this, there was no copyright. If you liked a book and you thought that other people would like it and you wanted to make money, you too could sell this book and you didn't have to pay the author. Um, but as more and more people started doing literary and artistic and technological things, they realized that there needed to be some motivation to, to keep creating. So they came up with the Copyright Act to give the creator some protections, rights, and money as encouragement for people to create new things. But this Copyright Act was a domestic Copyright Act. It only applied to art and creations born in the US. You could still steal things from Europe. Uh, in 1794, Eli Whitney patents the cotton gin. The cotton gin is a machine. Um, have you guys ever picked cotton? Okay, you know what cotton looks like, right? But what you don't know is that when cotton grows on the plant, the seeds grow inside of the cotton. And of course, if you have cotton with seeds, you can't turn that into fabric and clothing. So you have to pick out each seed from the cotton. It's hard, takes a long time, and after a while, your hands start to hurt. Nobody likes doing this. So the solution is to bring in enslaved Africans and make them do it. But slaves are expensive. Or I should say slaves were expensive. Like you're buying an entire human being. It's expensive to buy. It's expensive to keep them alive. You have to make sure that they can work. You have to make sure that they don't get too much power and fight you. So not every farmer could afford to buy and keep enslaved people. Um, 
Enter Eli Whitney. He comes up with a machine that can separate the seeds from the cotton. Um, and this makes it much easier for ordinary farmers to plant cotton and make a living for themselves. Now you might think, hey, there's a machine that can do this. Then people don't need to own slaves, right? No, under capitalism, uh, rich farmers add the machine to the slaves. So before they could only pick this much cotton. Now with the new machine, you can pick even more cotton. Um, but this also makes the, the economic power of the cotton planting states even stronger. Which also means that the states that allow slavery now have more economic power. In 1803, King Louis the 16th of France starts fighting another war and he needs money. And so he looks over at North America where France has a large piece of land that nobody is using, nobody has explored, nobody knows what's really there. And he thinks, you know what? I bet I can get some money for this land. I'm not using it. I can just sell it to somebody else. And so France sells it to the US for basically a very, very, very low price because King Louis the 16th really needed money. The Louisiana Purchase is basically between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. So like the entire middle section of the United States. Let me see if I can find you a map. Because this is like this is a huge deal. This white part is basically the new land that the United States acquired from France for a very low price. Um, so suddenly, when colonists were thinking about going further west to explore new areas, to develop new areas, they didn't have to worry about pissing off the French. They didn't have to worry about like any legal situation. They might cause a war between the US and France. Now it was all American. Uh, and so the government sent two explorers, Lewis and Clark. Can't remember their first names. Two guys. Uh, one was a geographer. One was a cartographer who created maps. Sent them off to explore this new area to find out what did we just buy? Like, what did we actually get? Um, and so this started a new era of pushing the frontier even further west. Uh, in 1807, um, the people who say that we should treat all human beings like human beings and therefore fought against slavery finally won a big argument and the government banned buying slaves from overseas. Notice the last two words, from overseas. You can still own enslaved people. You can still buy and sell enslaved people within the United States, but you could not buy them from other countries. Um, then in 1812, the British came back for revenge. Uh, and they started a war with the US. Um, this war is kind of stupid, I have to say. The actual reason for the war, like the 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 proximal reason, Xin, for the war is that the US and England disagreed about how to treat American sailors if they were caught doing a crime on British ships or like some very small reason. Uh, but they got into an argument, uh, started a war. And um, people looked at that war as the British chance for revenge, right? You're the first colony that I lost and now I have to treat you like a country. No, thanks. I'm going to take you back. 
and the U.S. won again. But a very important thing happened before the U.S. won. The British managed to get to Washington, D.C., and they managed to burn down the White House and the Capitol building, Guohe Dasha. And so one reason the White House is white is because when they rebuilt it, they used white to commemorate this event. Uh, like as a, a memory that this building was previously burned down. In 1815, Andrew Jackson, during the war, defeats the British at New Orleans. This event is very important because Andrew Jackson later becomes president. He becomes president as a representative of the ordinary people, the regular people. Most presidents at this time came from the upper class and they represented the upper class. Jackson was one of the earliest to represent the ordinary people. And the reason he was so popular is because people thought of him as a war hero, as somebody who made a great effort to defeat the British. Uh, and this is his main victory. And then in 1819 to 1820, Washington Irving published uh, his first collection of short stories called The Sketchbook first published in England. Even at this time, even though the US and England were two different countries, England had the bigger market. So authors always tried to get their books published in England as well. This is important because Washington Irving is often considered the first great American author. He's not just writing about history or culture, he's actually writing fiction. Uh, he's the author of his most famous story is Rip Van Winkle, the story of a guy who has a party, drinks some beer, falls asleep, wakes up 200 years later and uh, like goes to discover what society is all about. We're not going to read uh, Irving's work because there's so much more that we could read. So that's a summary of the early period. And the reason that the division with the next period is 1820 is because in 1820, something very important happens called the Missouri Compromise. From 1820 to 1865, this period is called the antebellum period. Anti means before. Bellum means war. Which war? The Civil War, Meguanetan. Uh, 1861 to 1865. We're going to talk about that later. Um, and once the, the first early sign that things are not going well, that the U.S. may have to fight a civil war, is with the Missouri Compromise. Remember, the Louisiana Purchase brought all of this new territory into the country. But as people slowly moved there, and developed and built towns and, and societies, one big question was left unanswered. Should we bring slaves? Basically, the north half of the country said no, the south half said yes. Um, and because there was no established government in that area yet, people got into battles and fights about this problem. Slavery is a serious issue. It's worth fighting for, right? You're buying and selling human beings and you're forcing them to work until they die. This is worth fighting for. Um, so the problem became so serious that the American Congress had to find a solution. And this is what they decided. Remember, Congress includes northern and southern states. So they came up with a compromise. They let Missouri in as a slave owning state. You could own enslaved people in Missouri. But at the same time, they also let in the state of Maine in the Northeast, which was bought from Canada. In Maine, you cannot own slaves. So like one yes, one no. Compromise. Um, as you might expect, nobody liked this idea. Um, and it did not solve any problems. It only ended the immediate problems. 
Um, so as the country grew and as people started moving west, um, there were, you know, there were there were reasons why this country continued to grow. One big reason is European immigration. As the Industrial Revolution got uh, going in Europe, more and more poor people thought their lives were terrible. They worked all like 20 hour days. Children worked in coal mines. It was not a human way to live. So many people decided to save whatever money they could and to try again in the new world. Also at this time, Ireland was a British colony and were being heavily mistreated. Uh, British landowners only cared about how much money they could make from farmers. They didn't care about the actual farmers. And so because of neglect and the lack of money for proper farming and because a series of years of failed potatoes, Ireland was suffering a famine, Ji Huang, and millions of Irish people uh, decided to move to the US to, to try again. And so as the population grew so quickly, as the cities grew so quickly, there was a lot of economic instability. Basically, a panic is a stock market crash. The stock market crashed in 1819, in 1837, in 1857, and also a few uh, less serious times in between. It was a really unstable time for the economy. In fact, one reason why it is so unstable when we talk about the stock market, we think about owning parts of companies and like uh, making bets about will this company do better or worse. But at that time, you could buy something else as well. You could own parts of slaves. Slaves, so you can own parts of property. You can use property to take out loans. Have you guys taken out a loan before? When you take out a loan, you have to promise the bank. If you cannot repay the loan, you will give the bank something to make sure that it doesn't lose all of its money. Uh, and slaves, enslaved people, were very valuable. So rich people who own slaves often use them as collateral when taking out a loan. They're saying to a bank, fine, if I can't pay back your money, you can have all of my slaves. And because slaves are so valuable, you could, like if you do a mortgage today, right? you can do a first mortgage, you can do a second mortgage, you can do a third mortgage. One house taking out three different loans. You can do, you used to be able to do that with slaves also. One person, you can use the ownership of that person to take out more than one loan. And so if you use that money and you put it in the stock market, that's not your money, that's the bank's money. Um, and so th that's one reason why the economy was so unstable. People were using other people's money to play the stock market. And as the population grew, as uh, slavery uh, became more part of the southern economy, as the value, the economic value of slaves became recognized, slave owners were able to take out bigger loans and do more with that money. Along with population growth and urbanization, was the development of periodical culture, magazines, newspapers, literary magazines, weeklies, bi-weeklies. Every city had at least three different newspapers. Um, and this is the source of most people's information and also the source of most people's entertainment. So when authors in this period wanted to get famous or make money, they would send their stories or poems to newspapers and magazines. And because there were more and more places to publish literature, women also had more chance as writers. And so this period saw some more popular women writers. The most famous one is 
Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women, Xiao Fu Nu. Uh, I think a, f a few years ago, there was another movie adaptation, but the Chinese title was Tamen for some strange reason. Um, even today, very popular book. In 1826, James Fenimore Cooper wrote and published The Last of the Mohicans. The Mohicans were a Native American people. This story is about um, a popular urban myth at the time. Many people told stories about how if you're not careful, like they would tell their children, right? If you don't behave, if you be careful, the Indians will come and take you away. Uh, and the idea was that some Indian tribes would steal white people and raise them as Indians. And so when they grew up, they would not be white people anymore. And because race was such an important part of the culture, you know, black slaves, white, free people, Indians, um, this was a terrifying story for white people. The Last of the Mohicans tells one kind of this story. It's about a young girl who was taken by the Mohicans and, uh, and uh, a male member of their family is sent to try to get her back, but he takes too long and when he reaches her, she has already become an Indian. Um, there was a movie version starring Daniel Day-Lewis and it won some Oscars. In 1827, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad began operation. This was the first major railroad, sorry, first public railroad in the United States. Previously, some companies had railroads, some rich people had their own railroads, but this was the first public railroad. Uh, it ran from Baltimore to Ohio, who, as you can see from the name. So it didn't go everywhere, but these two locations were very important. Baltimore, Maryland, opens up to the Atlantic Ocean. Ohio had the Great Lakes, Wudahu. So this railroad connected two major ports. Across the Great Lakes, uh, you can trade with Canada, you can go down the Mississippi River, uh, and you therefore have access to a lot of market and territory. Uh, so this was a very important railroad. And so with the connection of this railroad, eastern markets could now open up even further west. And so this period is called the American Renaissance because market includes literary markets. Now East Coast authors could more easily reach their uh, readership and audience in the middle of the country. And at this time, you also had steamships, you had canals, and of course, railroads. Oh, sorry, sorry. In 1828, Andrew Jackson was finally elected president. Um, Andrew Jackson, a very, very controversial president. First of all, oh, people say he was the Donald Trump of his day. First of all, because he's not from the upper class. Uh, secondly, because he was famous not for being a good politician or being like a good uh, diplomat or statesman. He was a good general. He was a good fighter. And then finally, because his main policy is that all of the United States all of the continent of the United States, not just the land that they already own, but the entire continent should belong to white people. And so any Native Americans, we white people have the right to send them away. And if they don't want to go away, we can force them. This was the policy of the 1830 Indian Removal Act. Um, and this is often referred to as the second genocide of Native Americans. The first one, of course, is when Europeans first came and spread disease. This was also a genocide because when you force somebody to leave, you don't wait for them to get ready. You don't try to take care of them on the way. You, As long as they go, as long as they're gone, that's all you care about. So, so many Native Americans died on the way to wherever the government wanted them to go. 
uh, and that forced removal, that journey is called the Trail of Tears. Why did Jackson believe this? He believed in an ideology called manifest destiny. Manifest means it's very clear. Why is it clear? Because there are white people who believe in God and they think God put us here in this place so that we could have control of and take care of this continent. Otherwise, we would not be here. So Manifest Destiny said that we have the right to take control over the entire continent. It all belongs to us. It's also connected with the idea of American exceptionalism. Exceptional means special, unique, uniquely good. The Americans believe that because God put them there, God must have had a reason. He must have chosen us to be here. And therefore, if, as long as we work for God, we are doing the right thing. Now, the key point is, how do you know if you're working for God, right? Um, but they didn't worry about that. They thought as long as we believe in God, whatever we do is for God. Um, today, American exceptionalism still exists. Not like the God part has gotten less important. Now it's more about Americans are exceptional because we are the most powerful country in the world. Uh, we spread freedom and democracy. Uh, we try to help everybody ha gain human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, like people should treat us special. They should give us respect. They should follow what we want them to do. The basic expression of American exceptionalism is many Americans have very, very little knowledge of foreign affairs or even like where a country is or what a country is called. Because to them, uh, for many Americans, the most important country in the world is the US. So as long as they know about the US, everything else is not important. Um, OK, so with Manifest Destiny and exceptionalism, there was a push westward. More and more people wanted to develop this continent that they now have and wanted to spread Western civilization. And so as people move west, they also wrote about it and created the genre of westward travel literature. 1832, now we're back to talk about the Civil War. The nullification crisis. So um, the state of South Carolina got into an argument with the federal government. And South Carolina said, the federal government has authority only because we states give it authority. We states are the source of that authority. So if we don't want to follow the government, we have the right not to follow the government. I'm sure you can agree this is a very bullshit kind of reasoning, right? Um, but that's what South Carolina talked about, and they almost started the Civil War early, uh, except that um, they, they managed to come up with a short-term compromise that, again, pushed the start of the war just a few years later. But this is basically the, the central argument of the Civil War. It is about slavery, but it's about states' rights to allow slavery. It's not about whether individual people can own other people. It's about whether each state can make their own rules about whether people should own people. States' rights. Um, and so even today, you will find people, especially in the American South, who will tell you, no, no, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. Slavery just happened to be the thing they were arguing about. But the historical documents show that this is not correct. States' rights were almost always about slavery. Yes, if you think about the idea of states' rights, they could have argued about anything. But the truth is, they almost always argued about slavery. So the Civil War was about slavery. States' rights is just the legal fiction, the, the legal framework in which they talked about slavery. 
1844, Samuel Morse invents the telegraph, 电报. Suddenly, you didn't have to wait six months for a letter from California. It could get here immediately uh, using electricity. And so the country suddenly feels united, really united, not just politically, but you could literally communicate with somebody anywhere in the US for just a little money immediately. 1846 to 48 is the Mexican War. Uh, this is, I think, the first time the US fought a war with a new world country. This is not a European country. It's a North American country. The Mexicans already fought the war of independence against Spain. They were recently independent. Uh, and the US was kind of threatened by this, right? You have a young nation in the South. They're hungry for new territory. They want to be able to, to really have good control of their own country and territory. What if they have some designs on the south of the US. And so instead of waiting to see whether the Mexicans were peaceful, the Americans provoked them and started a war and immediately won the war. Even at the time, this was controversial. Many people opposed this war. They saw very clearly there was no good reason to fight the Mexicans. Um, and in between, in 1845, uh, Texas was annexed. Texas was originally part of Mexico as the state of Tejas. In Spanish, the sound of X is ha. Uh, so Tejas, um, and then the people living in Texas thought, you know what, I'd rather be part of the US. So they declared independence, and then they elected a governor, and through a process that looks like a democracy, they decided to apply to the US to join as the American state of Texas. And ultimately, they succeeded. But in the middle, the Texans also fought a war of independence against Mexico, and they won. So like the American South at, and in these few years was also very confusing. You stand in one place, and depending on whether it is 1844 or 1849, you could be in four different countries. In 1848, New York holds the Women's Convention of, I can't remember the city. It was, it was held in uh, Seneca Falls, New York. This was the first major con convention discussing women's rights. Um, at the time, women were considered slightly less than human. And so women also did not have a lot of basic rights, like the right to own property, the right to start a business, the right to live alone without the protection of a man, the right to vote, all of these things. So this convention was very important in promoting these ideas and setting up a movement to fight for these ideas in the future. Uh, yeah, so women's rights. Uh, and then women also cared about being treated well by their male family members, and being treated well means that their male family members probably should not be drunk. Temperance is the movement against alcohol. Not just drink less, no alcohol. Uh, and this movement finally succeeded in the early 20th century, which we, I guess we may talk about later. There were 10 years, I think from 1922 to 1932, when alcohol was illegal in the U.S. according to the constitutional amendment. They changed the constitution to ban alcohol. Um, but that stopped when people realized that when you ban alcohol, it doesn't stop people from drinking. It stops people from drinking legally. Uh, and so if you create a black market for alcohol, that's even more problematic than simply having a regular market for alcohol. Uh, so they changed the constitution again to repeal the earlier amendment. But anyway, this is the source of that idea of not drinking. Uh, and then connected with the idea of sympathy, of treating human beings as human beings, uh, women also led the fight against slavery and against poverty. 
1848 to 1855, there was the California Gold Rush. Somebody discovered gold in California, and suddenly loads of people traveled across the country trying to strike it rich. Um, most people did not succeed. You had a better chance of getting rich by selling gold mining equipment than of mining for gold. Uh, in 1850, the Congress passed a law called the Fugitive Slave Act, which says if a slave runs away and enters a free state where slavery is banned, people in the free state had to return that slave back to the South. So in the past, if a slave wanted to run away, they made it to the North and they were basically fine. But now, if they want to run away, they have to go all the way to Canada. This act was later repealed in the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, which created its own problems. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is kind of like the Missouri Compromise. Again, the country is expanding west should these new states allow slavery. And this time, instead of making a decision, Congress says, Fuck it, you decide. And they said the states can vote on whether they want slavery or not. What this really meant is that supporters of slavery and opponents of slavery flooded these two states to try to win the majority vote. And so you had skirmishes and battles and things got really bloody during that period. Um, Right, and though, of course, finally, the question was settled, but not before a lot of people died about it. In 1850, Nathaniel Hawthorne published his most famous work, the novel a Scar uh, The Scarlet Letter. Uh, the story is about a woman who has a ch an unmarried woman who has a child. And this is a scandal because, again, Hawthorne is writing historical fiction set in a religious, a highly religious society. So the woman's punishment is that she always has to wear a red letter A for adultery, Hun Wai Qing. Adultery today means if you're married and you have sex with somebody else. At that time, adultery meant if you're not married and you have sex or if you're married and you have sex with somebody else. Basically, any sex outside of your own marriage. Um, and it's a famous work because it doesn't just talk about like why this is bad. The, the novel actually explores the woman's psychology, her experiences, how much she suffers, how much she regrets her decision, or sometimes does not regret her decision, how cruel the society can be toward her, and also the effect on her child. Um, right, so we're not going to read a whole novel by Hawthorne. Uh, we're only reading a short story, but this is his most famous work. Um, so this period was really good for American literature. You also had Moby Dick by Jing Ji by Herman Neville. Have you guys read Moby Dick in Chinese? It's a very weird novel. You have the story of the captain who wants to hunt the whale, but then you have dozens and dozens of pages about the science of whales, about the science of ships, like just really weird stuff. Uh, but it was very popular for some reason. It's a great book. Novels can do many different things, but it's, it's probably not what you expect. 1852, you have Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. This story is a, a story about slaves, African slaves, um, and about how it feels like to be a slave. At this point, there had been famous African Americans who had escaped slavery and had written about their stories. Harriet Beecher Stowe was a white woman, and she used the tricks of fiction to really give her readers the feeling of suffering in slavery. And so even though real African Americans had written about their life, they wrote about it as a series of facts. 
Stowe wrote about it from the perspective of emotions. And this novel was a huge bestseller, and it really helped promote the idea of opposing slavery emotionally. Like many people already agreed slavery was wrong and bad, but reading this novel really made you feel why and just how bad it is. And so it added energy to the anti slavery movement. Speaking of black people, in 1853, William Wells Brown published the novel Clotel in England. This is uh, important because it's the first novel written by a black American. But because of the race question, it could only be published in England. Is it a good novel? It's okay, but it's the first one. And you know, it's not easy to write a novel. 1854, Henry David Thoreau publishes Walden. I think in Chinese we call this Hu Bing San Ji. A series of essays about nature and returning to nature and how civilization is bad for your soul. What, what Thoreau did not tell you is that yes, he lived by Walden Pond. He moved to the pond and lived away from town, but he only lived like two miles away from town. His mother did his laundry. So it's more of an idea than it is an actual uh, record of historical events. He was like playing pretend, if you will. Um, but it helped to add to the growing movement of transcendentalism, also called American Romanticism, whose main proponent, whose main proponent was the poet and essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson. I'm Wilson, a friend of mine recently translated a collection of Emerson's essays. Uh, and our library has a copy if you're interested. Um, and some key ideas from this movement include the healing power of nature, but also the idea that the human self is already holy. You as a complete human being are a holy being, and therefore you have to work to improve yourself uh, and you can get inspiration from the miracles of everyday life. Transcendental, transcendentalism is usually translated as Cao Ran Zhu Yi, and you can see why. 1855, Walt Whitman's first edition of his poems, Leaves of Grass. Whitman is probably the most important American poet. We're going to read, I think, one of his poems. His poems can be very long, so we're only going to read, I think, one. 1857, the Supreme Court decides a decision, Dred Scott versus Sanford. The Supreme Court decides that, yes, if a slave escapes to the north, you legally have to return them to the south. Today, uh, historians consider this one of the worst Supreme Court decisions. 1859, John Brown, passionate anti-slavery activist, leads a group of people to attack a federal arsenal, Dring Huo Ku, at Harper's Ferry. They were going to start the Civil War again early, uh, but they were defeated quite quickly and they failed. This event was also important because so many people supported John Brown at his trial. Even though he was rebelling against the government, people believed in what he was fighting for. And so finally in 1861, things could not be put off any longer. Once again, South Carolina started making trouble. And this time the US government could not find a way out of the crisis and the civil war began. Um, now the last thing is the Homestead Act. Abraham Lincoln, uh, when he first began trying to fight the civil war, the North was at first losing. The South had more money, more power, and also better generals. So Lincoln had to find some ways to help the North uh, to give the North an advantage. One thing he thought of is if you fight, uh, if you, what was it? If you fight for the North and you retire, the American government will give you land and money to start your own place in the West. So by this measure, Lincoln helped to develop the undeveloped West, 
and encouraged people to fight for the North. In 1863, he announced the Emancipation Proclamation, nope, which said if the Northern Army comes to your home and wins a battle there, then all of your slaves go free. In other words, now uh, slaves had a strong encouragement to help the North win, because if the Northern Army comes to your town, you are no longer a slave. But the, there's a key trick here. Lincoln announced this in 1863. The war began in 1861. So all of the territory that the North won in these two years, the slaves there were still slaves. It only applied to the new territory after 1863. Um, of course, slavery was later fully abolished, but only after the war. Okay, so before next week, please finish reading the story and we will come and discuss it.